straight life. Hare Krishna. Welcome to another evening in Lives of the Vaishnava Charyas. I'm your host, Chaturatma Das. Very nice to be with you again this evening. I was looking a little ahead at the chat room here, and we got all the usual characters, Vaishnava characters. Mauricio, glad to see you were able to make it home from work. Adi Kavi, I see you're new to our Monday night chat rooms. Kartika, nice to see you again. And we're honored to have the Marquis de la Crosse with us this evening, it looks like. That's an inside secret for those of us that live here in Alachua. <laughs> All right. So, sound vibration. Sound vibration is really important. Um... The very concept of sound vibration moves both from that sound vibration which is positive and that sound vibration which can have an impact. And as we're speaking about sound vibration, Kartik says she has no sound. Uh, anybody else not having any sound before I continue on about sound vibration? <laughs> Kartik, refresh your... Oh, let her know to refresh. Yeah. yeah. And uh, see if that does it. Uh, Adi, um, Mauricio, let me know if you all have um, sound, just to be sure before we move any further. Okay, Adi's got sound. Marquis de la Crosse, you have sound. I don't want anybody else to think that, you know, they've missed something. We'll just give it... Oh, okay, Mauricio's loud and cure. So, Kartika, it's... Uh, it's your connection somehow. So we're going to go ahead and continue on. All right. So as I was saying, sound vibration. Sound vibration is very, very essential. We spoke, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, about Bhaktivinoda Thakur's list of uh, kata, if you will, of idle conversation, of um, things that we should avoid. And uh, one of the most important things we can do to counteract both in our personal life and in a more universal life, if we want to look, I mean, just like these last couple of days, they had uh, this uh, Earth Hour. You know, all the cities or many cities around the world shut off all their electricity and everybody went by candlelight. So, uh, you know, the idea was to make an Earth-wide impact. So if we wanted to look at how can I engage sound vibration and make an earthwide impact, there's one very easy way. That's called kirtan. The importance of kirtan cannot be stressed because kirtan means what? Kirtan means to glorify the holy name of the Lord. Now, you know, there may be other kirtan ears or kirtan processes, but the Kirtan process as delineated by the Shastra and given to us by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is um, thank you is the process of Kirtan uh, in the beginning we have the uh, instructions on how to engage in devotional service Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu Smarnam by speaking and hearing chanting and Kirtan hearing and Kirtan by these two processes, we will be able to do what? Move to the third process, Vishnu Smarnam. Remember the Lord. So, very, very important. Um, my good friend Satyaraj Prabhu has recently written a book called The Art of Kirtan. And it uh, is conversation with many different uh, modern kirtaneers, if you will. Not all necessarily in our Godia line, but engaging many of the traditional Vaishnava chants. And this is becoming a very popular thing nowadays because people realize that they need something to give them satisfaction other than the mundane activities of the daily world. I have one of those little uh, Prabhupada calendars. You know, it's just got the date on it, uh, the date, a month and the date, so you can use it year after year after year. And today's Prabhupada speaks very strongly about hearing the spiritual sound vibration. Actually, in 1971, Srila Prabhupada made a statement to a Chutananda who at the time was living in Mayapur and was chiefly responsible for what we had at that time, the translation of the songs of the Vaishnavacharyas, the prominent songs of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. 
And in the inner, in the uh, dedication there, they quote Prabhupada that the safest position in the material world is Kirtan Ras. So today we're going to speak about three very, very important Kirtan personalities. And that is the famous Ghosh Brothers. Now, before we go into the Ghosh Brothers, Yadevi has mentioned that the broadcast looks very green. It's probably due to the fact that I've got a green sweater on Yadevi, and our black wall is becoming more and more muted episode after episode. So it's a little off color there. So uh, we just hope that it's not the green envy from my heart that's manifesting through the camera. <laughs> All right. So the Ghosh Brothers. The Ghosh Brothers are very, very famous. I'm sure in each of your temples, your communities, <clears throat> you have some family of devotees. Here in Alachua, we have many families of devotees, and it seems like almost all of them are connected into the same line. But uh, many of these devotees have multiple brothers and sisters in the family and connected very strongly to the kirtan process. So the origin of this family kirtan style comes from the famous Ghosh brothers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's associates. I'm going to read a very nice little verse from the Gora Gonadesha Depika. We've mentioned many times this is by Kavi Karnapur. Uh, Kalavati Rasolasa Gunatungar Braje Stita Sri Vishaka Kirtam Gityam Gayanti Smada Tamata Govinda Madhavananda Vasudeva Yatakramam. So the translation is that Govinda, Madhava, and Vasudev Gosh were three gopis during Braj Lila, namely Kalavati, Rasolasa, and Gunatunga. These three used to sing songs composed by Vishaka for the pleasure of Radha and Krishna. So this is very, very interesting. We see that these three personalities we're going to speak about tonight who were greatly known for their kirtan, in their brudge form during Krishna Lila, were also engaged in that same activity of kirtan. Satatam kirtayantomam. Kirtan is an eternal process. So we see this in the example. Now, these individuals, their home village was in Sri Hatta. And um, this is a, a, an area of Kumarhat. Now, we've spoken about Kumarhat many times. It's in the uh, uh, Bengal area where many of the famous uh, residents are. We were just reviewing that some of those famous persons from Kumarhat, of course, Ishwar Puri, the guru of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, one of Mahaprabhu's most important associates, Sri Vas Thakur, um, one of his most important disciples, uh, Jiva, uh, Jiva Goswami, uh, as well as uh, one of the personalities, uh, the most exemplary grahasta that I can think of, Shivananda Sain. So these are all personalities from the village of Kumar. Add to that the family of the Goshas and a uh, very, very wonderful place to live. So these three boys lived there with their father. Now, uh, their father resided there, but at some point, uh, an early biographical sketch isn't really given, but at some point in their uh, earlier life, their father passed away. And um, uh, Vasudev, Govinda, and Madhava, all three together, they moved to what we now know as Navadvipdam. They knew that in Navadvip, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes are going on, and so they wanted to go. Now, their background, they came from a Kasta caste, and um, you know these are people which are dealing in different types of business activities. This caste originates in the Radhadesh area of Bengal. This is the area of Bengal where the Ganges does not flow. And uh, so uh, they made this move to Navadweep and resided there. And uh, the three of them were understood to be eternal associates of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and eternal associates of Nichinanda Prabhu. Um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur has mentioned that they are all three situated in Madhuri Ras and that they have accepted Srimati Radhika as their uh, Ashraya Vigraha, as the personality whom they take shelter of in the process of devotional service. 
So uh, uh, it's also explained in another uh, Gora literature called the Gora Prashada Charitavala. This uh, is a nice book describing some of Mahaprabhu's associates as well. And it says that these three brothers, Vasudev Ghosh, Govinda Ghosh, and Makunda Ghosh, were especially sweet-throated singers. Now, sometimes this phrase is used for birds. I have this one recording at home. It's called the Songbirds of America. And it's got like 25 tracks of different... And some of them are called the Sweet-throated Warbler, for instance, you know. So these... And, and the description is meant to give a very, very pleasant image to the eye of what this sound must be. To the mind, rather. So in this way, the sweet-throated singers of Mahaprabhu's pastimes are Govinda, Madhava, and Vasudev Ghosh. says that when the three of them would sing, that uh, Nityananda would immediately dance upon hearing their singing. Now, Krishna Das Kaviraj gives a nice description in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Many times we quote from a variety of different Chaitanya Lila literatures, we should always take the opportunity to be familiar with Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, I remember as a young brahmachari back in the early 70s when a new volume of the Chaitanya Charitamrita would come out, the devotees would just be ecstatic. You know, we would take get one advanced volume and pass it around and everybody would read it and share it and look at the pictures and tell stories from it on our Sankirtan activities and like that. So, you know, we should always be uh, very aware of the nectar that is available in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. <clears throat> so, in that wonderful literature, Kaviraj Goswami writes, the three brothers, Govinda, Madhava, and Vasudev, were the 82nd, 83rd, and 84th branches of the tree of Sri Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda used to dance regularly at their performances. Now, Srila Prabhupada mentions in the purport, <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada mentions in the purport that um, these three brothers, uh, as I mentioned, belong to the Kayasta uh, caste, and that Govinda, as we'll hear a little later, is very much connected with the Gopinath deity. Uh, then, of course, there's a wonderful description that says the notorious, notorious, not notorious, notorious, notorious Madhava Ghosh devoted himself to the process of Kirtan. And not only did he devote himself to it, but he was also very, very expert in the process of kirtan. Okay, now we have uh, some confusion here. What do we got? Um, jot him a line. We're going to work on it because I want to wait and let everybody catch yeah. up before we move ahead. Yes, okay. It's back on. It's back. Okay, good. All right, so everybody's back in. All right, good, good. You know, if you happen to watch any type of television or maybe you see a movie once in a while, whatever, whenever there's technology used, everything just works perfect. You know, they put the disc in the computer and in seconds the whole file downloads or they have these little earpieces and can communicate all over the world, you know. And uh, the reality is actually quite different in our technological age. Unless, of course, you have the financial backing of huge governments. And uh, we don't. But we have your financial backing. So thank you very much. <laughs> all right. So we're all back now. Good, good. Okay. So as we were describing, I was mentioning how Govinda is very much connected with the Gopinath deity. And we'll discuss this more later. And how Madhava Ghosh was very well known for his kirtan style. He was a, a singer, as we mentioned, in Rindavan. And was very dear to Lord Nichinanda. He was actually one of the uh, associates of Nityananda. Very dear. He and Vasudev were considered branches of the tree of Lord Nityananda, and Govinda was considered a branch of the tree of Lord Chaitanya. Even though all three were gopis. All, all three were gopis. But they had these different branches, you know, interesting. Multiple personalities. Govinda was counted amongst Mahaprabhu's branches. Um, and because of that, he was actually very active in many of the pastimes of Mahaprabhu in his Navadvipa Lila. Particularly, we had the uh, Sri Vasangam pastimes. He was there for that. He was involved in the Naga Sankirtan pastimes at the Kazi's house. 
Um, he was involved in the Kirtan pastimes at Raghava Pandit's house. Uh, Raghava Pandit, you may remember, lived a short distance uh, between uh, Calcutta and Mayapur is um, Panihati. This was uh, uh, near the residence there. So in this way, he was staying, he was involved in these different pastimes. Now, when Mahaprabhu left Navadweep and went to Nilachala, Jagannath Puri, to reside there after taking sannyas, as we mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, that most exemplary of Grahasta, Shivananda Sain, he arranged, as we've spoken about many times, the annual travel of so many pilgrims from uh, Navadweep, Mayapur, Bengal area, to Nilachala Jagannath Puri for the annual Rathiatra festival. Not only would he arrange this, but he would take care of all the tolls and he would take care of the Pushadam arrangements. He would take care of the uh, living facilities along the way. This generally turned out to be a four month endeavor. I was just listening to a lecture this morning by Shivaram Swami about the importance of having our homes blessed by receiving Vaishnavas and serving Vaishnavas. And Shivananda Sain, four months of the year, his entire consciousness was absorbed, well, probably his entire life, I should say, but particularly four months of the year, his entire consciousness was absorbed in serving the Vaishnavas by facilitating their travel to Jagannath Puri, being able to be comfortable in Puri, and their travel back. So, in this way, uh, the three Ghosh brothers, uh, they also were there to take part in these uh, activities, going to Rath Yatra like that every year. Now, in the Rath Yatra pastimes, you'll all remember there were seven kirtan parties. And the Chaitani Charitamrita very uh, exactingly describes the different parties who was leading, who was responding, who was playing cartels, how many madungas there were, who was doing the dancing like that. So during this Rath Yatra festival, the fourth kirtan group of the seven, the fourth kirtan group were uh, uh, the lead singer, was um, Govinda. And Govinda was uh, followed by his two brothers, Madhava and Mukunda. In that same group was Junior Haridas, Vishnu Das, and Raghava Pandit. So there's your seven kirtan players. So remember, it was seven kirtan people in each group, seven groups, 49 kirtan players, and then each group had a dancer. And in this particular group, the dancer was Vakreshwar Pandit. He was the principal dancer. There were so many other dancers as well. Now, and of course, every kirtan group has many responders. So the core kirtan group, as it were, would be the seven different kirtan groups. And in this particular group, the singing leading was done by Govinda. His two brothers were there, Vasudev and Madhava. Uh, also was Raghava Pandit, Junior Haridas, and Vishnu Das. And then the seventh member was the dancer, which was... Vakreshwar Pandit. So, very, very nice kirtan party. And these kirtan pastimes are described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita by Krishna Das Kaviraj. And I want to take a moment and read about this Rathyatra pastime. Um, we're not that far from Rathyatra season as it comes upon us. And many devotees take the opportunity to follow the Rathyatra around. And I think it would be nice here to hear a little bit of a description about how wonderful those kirtan pastimes were. The San Kirtan party comprising these three brothers and their performance at the Rathyatra is described as follows. Everyone was astonished to see the decorations on the Rathyatra cart. The car appeared to be made of gold and it was as high as Mount Sumeru. The decorations included bright mirrors and hundreds and hundreds of chamaras. On top of the car was a neat and clean canopy and a very beautiful flag. The car was also decorated with silken cloth and various pictures. Many brass bells, gongs, and ankle bells rang from the cart. For the pastime of the Rathyatra ceremony, Lord Jagannath got on one cart. His sister Subhadra and elder brother Balaram got on two other cars. For fifteen days, Lord Jagannath had remained in a secluded place with the supreme goddess of fortune and had performed his pastimes with her. 
Having taken permission from the goddess of fortune, the Lord came out to ride on the Rathyatra car and perform his pastimes for the pleasure of the devotees. As the car stood still, Sri Chaitanya gathered up all his devotees and with his own hand decorated them with garlands and sandalwood pulp. Parmananda Puri and Brahmananda Bharati were both personally given garlands and sandalwood pulp from the very hands of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This increased their transcendental pleasure. Similarly, when Advaita Acharya and Nityananda Prabhu felt the touch of the transcendental hand of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they were both very pleased. The Lord also gave garlands and sandalwood pulp to the performers of the Sankirtan. The chief performers were Sarup Damodar and Srivas Thakur. There were altogether four parties of kirtan performers compromising 24 chanters. In each party, there were two Murdunga players, making an additional eight persons. When the four parties were formed, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, after some consideration, divided the chanters. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ordered Nichinanda Prabhu, Advaita Charya, Haridas, and Vakreshwar Pandit to dance in each of the four groups. Aside from this, there were three other groups. The Lord formed another one, appointing Govinda Ghosh as the leader. In this group, Chodahari Das, Vishnu Das, and Raghava Pandit sang in response to Govinda Ghosh. The two brothers of Govinda Ghosh, Madhava Ghosh and Vasudev, also joined this group. In that kirtan group, Vakreshwar Pandit was the dancer. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu performed his pastimes for some time in this way. He personally sang and induced his personal associates to dance. Krishna Das Kaviraj has continued to explain that by the order of Sri Chaitanya... Oh, I'm sorry, that's a different point. So we see this description of these kirtan parties and how essential these three brothers, the Ghosh brothers whom we're speaking about, were to the kirtan lila of Mahaprabhu. Govinda Ghosh was there. First, they all three moved to Navadweep for Mahaprabhu's early pastimes there. Govinda Ghosh was very, very closely involved in the pastimes at Sri Vasangam. Uh, the brothers were involved in the pastimes at the Kazi's house, one of the most famous kirtan parties of Mahaprabhu's Navadweep Lila. The Sri Vasangam kirtan, we separate that a little bit in its category because this was Mahaprabhu's intimate personal associates only. We know the story of how someone tried to sneak in, two different stories of how people tried to sneak in, and they were not allowed to do this because these were the very, very high level rasa kirtans. But during the day, Mahaprabhu's street kirtan was of another mood, was of a mood that incorporated everyone. So the Kazi kirtan is one of the most famous of this. He gathered so many of his followers to go there. Why? Because the Kazi had refused. We were just discussing, was it today? No, yesterday's Srimad Bhatt. No, today's Monday. So Saturday's Chaitanya Charitamrita class here in Alachua, Sesha Prabhu was speaking about this incident with the Kazi and how the government sometimes would step forward and Prabhupada's uh, particular angle on that. I think we mentioned it last week here also about uh, these uh, two weeks ago, something like that. So these kirtans are very important and these three brothers were essential. Now, in Jagannath Puri, we know that uh, one year, Mahaprabhu took Nityananda aside and he requested Nityananda that you please don't come each year. And he sent him back. So he sent him back because Mahaprabhu was concerned that there would be no one to continue the preaching on in a regular way in Bengal since he was staying in Jagannath Puri. So he sent Nityananda back and he sent Madhava and Vasudev Ghosh with him. This is indicated in different places as the first time in the life where the boys were separated, the brothers were separated for some distance like this. So Vasudev and, and this is why as I mentioned earlier, the split there that Vasudev and Mukunda were considered followers of Nityananda and Govinda was considered a follower of Mahaprabhu because Mahaprabhu allowed Govinda to stay back in Jagannath Puri with him. And Govinda was engaged in the different activities in Puri. So these three brothers went with the prospective lords, Nityananda, and stayed with Chaitanya there in Puri. 
and began to continue preaching in that way. Now, Govinda Ghosh, while he was in Puri, was very, very satisfied to serve Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You can just imagine the great satisfaction and pleasure he had. And then Mahaprabhu uh, went on his tour to Vrindavan. We know that Mahaprabhu left uh, Puri for some time, went to Vrindavan, and then returned back to Puri. And during that trip, Govinda Gosha accompanied him. So we can just see that Govinda was very dear in this way to the Lord. In due course of time, as the pastimes go, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu departed from this world. After his departure from this world, the brothers, more or less, it mentions, went their separate ways. Excuse me, just one moment. I wonder if professionals take a drink. <laughs> okay, so, after the departure of Sri Titani Mahaprabhu, of course, Nichinanda departed not long after that. And the brothers went their separate ways. It mentions that Madhava went to live in a place called Danihata. And that Vasudev went to live in a place called Tamala. <laughs> the bottle sauce, okay. <laughs> yeah, Davy, you're distracting my focus here today. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, after uh, Madhava went to Danihata, and after Vasudev went to Tamala, this left Govinda. Now, Govinda, he returned to Agra Dweep. Uh, Agra Dweep is um, it's actually right in the Navadweep Bengal area. It's 26 miles from our current Mayapur temple, from that area there. And then it's uh, six miles from Katwa. Katwa, of course, being the place where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu shaved his head, took sannyas. So it's right in that area. Now, previously, Govinda had some activities in Agra Dweep, and we're going to speak about those, and this is why he went back there. When Mahaprabhu was either traveling to or from, that's not very clear, Vrindavan from Puri, they stopped in Agra Dweep, and Mahaprabhu was there taking lunch prasadam. After finishing his lunch, he requested of Govinda some haritaki. Haritaki is a type of a uh, fruit that you, it's a kind of a spicy kind of fruit thing that you take. It's for helping with digestion and as a mouth freshener. It does both. So he asked Govinda Ghosh for some of that. And Govinda Ghosh rather quickly produced some. And Mahaprabhu was a little surprised. Oh. He said, how did you produce this so quickly? Govinda didn't respond. Mahaprabhu said, I can understand that you have a habit of saving things. And perhaps you should stay here and take charge of the worship of the deity Gopinath. Now, the Gopinath deity had not yet been established at that time. So, two things are instructive here. First of all, Mahaprabhu felt the importance of having persons in place before the deity came was essential. And second was that as a sannyasi, he did not approve that one should um, store things, stash things. What did he call that? Uh, there was another incident with one of the devotees stalking. I forget who the other devotee was. So anyway, in this way, following Mahaprabhu's instruction, Govinda stayed there. But, uh, you know, you can imagine he was really feeling separation from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, some days later, he was taking his bath in the Ganga, and he felt something bump his back. And he turned and he saw that it was a huge log. Some sort of wood it appeared to be, but it was very, very heavy. He was, matter of fact, quite surprised how it was floating. So, he pushed it to the shore, out of the water, and then that night he had a dream. And in that dream, Mahaprabhu, uh, um, I'm sorry, he, in the dream he got the instruction from a divine personality to turn that log over to Mahaprabhu. Apparently Mahaprabhu was going to come. So in this way, uh, he got up from the dream in the middle of the night, went to the river, 
and went to move this log. Well, as it turns out, it wasn't a log at all. It was a very huge shila, a stone shila that was floating. Imagine that. So, even more amazing, the next day, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu turned up at his front door. <laughs> now, of course, Mahaprabhu was traveling here and traveling there like that. So, <clears throat> he, um, oops. Ah. excuse me, just one second. There we go, that page sticking again. So Mahaprabhu showed up at his front door and he said, Look, Govinda. He said, You don't have anything to worry about anymore. He said, Tomorrow a sculptor will come and you should engage him in carving the deity of Gopinath. And then you can install that deity. And then after the installation of that deity, you will stay here in Agra Dutmasi to the service of that deity. So in this way, the Shila was carved into the beautiful form of Gopinath that you can still see there today. Now, in due course of time, before departing, Mahaprabhu also instructed that Gopinath should get married. We see a similar mood in Gopal Patako Swami when he had the young Brahmin boy Damodar. You may remember the story that when Gopal was in Badrinath, he was going traveling village to village, I mean, uh, uh, traveling about, and it was very rain-driven night, very, very wet. And he took refuge in one Brahmin's home who gave him shelter. <clears throat> and so then, <clears throat> excuse me, that Brahmin told him that when my son, uh, my wife and I are not able to have a child, and we're very much wanting to have a child. So Mahaprabhu, uh, I'm sorry, Gopapata blessed him that you'll have a son. And he said, if I do have a son, I will send him to be your servant. So, ten years passed. And after that ten years passed, up at uh, his doorstep, when Gopal came back from his morning bath, he found this young Brahmin boy. And he said, may I help you? He said, my father has sent me here to serve you. So, this was his name was Damodar. So this was uh, the first disciple of Gopal Bhatta for the purpose of serving Radha, Dham, Radha uh, Raman. And he wanted him to get married because his concern, which brings me to the point we're discussing, his concern was for the longevity, the long-term seva of the deity. This requires householders because you can't have generational service if you got sannyasis. There's no generational. <laughs> At least it better not be. <laughs> so, in this way, he was concerned. So, in the same way we see, Mahaprabhu was equally concerned that the service of the Govinda, uh, Gopinath deity should be taken care of. So, he asked Govinda to get married. So, Govinda got married and had a very nice son. One unfortunate thing happened. That the son and the wife both very shortly, one right after the other, passed away. Now you can imagine if in a very short span of time, the wife and the son both pass away, even for an exalted devotee, this is a lot to have to, you know, accept and carry on. So for the purpose of the divine pastime, which we'll hear, Govinda began to manifest a deep feeling of despondency, and a deep feeling of, of grieving at the loss of these family members. <laughs> we know that and we've seen, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this, that when there's deep grieving, one becomes neglectful of their responsibilities, of their activities. So in this way, Govinda was so deeply absorbed in this mood of grieving that he forgot his service to the deity. He gave up his service to Gopinath. So one night, Lord Gopinath appeared in a dream to Govinda. He said, Govinda, do you think it is proper when a person loses one son that he should starve the other son so that he will also die? <laughs> 
So this was the Lord addressing him like that. So Govinda said, it was my hope that by having a son, I would be survived by that son and he would perform the necessary rituals on the Shraddha ceremony for the remembrance of my departed soul and those of my forefathers. So that's not going to happen now because you've taken my son away. So what will I gain by serving you? Wow. Now, we can see how this is clearly the divine pastime of the Lord because we're talking about a personality that in Krishna Lila was an eternal gopi <laughs> and engaged in the service of Radha and Krishna on the direction of Vishaka by singing beautiful songs. And now... He's thinking, what will I gain by serving the Lord? This is not even possible. <laughs> so, this was going on in this way. Now, this is explained in Shastra. The One of the functions of the Karma Khanda section of the Vedas is begetting a son. So that the son will be able to perform the necessary purificatory and remembrance worship of the father and the forefathers for their deliverance to the higher heavenly planets. This is an important aspect of Grihastra life that one has a son. Now, of course, from this has become the completely misconstrued idea nowadays in so-called modern India in rural places where there'll be daughters born and they neglect them because, oh, we only want sons. So very foolish understanding. So anyway, Govinda was presenting to the Lord like this. <clears throat> You've taken my son, and yet you want me to serve you? What will I gain by serving you? So the Lord responded, I promise you that I will celebrate the Shraddha ceremony on the anniversary of your death in the proper manner forever after you depart. Now, please, can you give me something to eat? <laughs> now this shows the understanding of the Lord and his devotee. The devotee simply wanted to be sure this was taken care of. And so the Lord said, all right, there, I've taken care of that. Now can we get on with this business of serving me? <laughs> so in this way, Govinda was very, very delighted to hear the promise of the Lord and immediately returned to his proper seva for Gopinath. So in this way, the Gopinath deity after the departure of Govinda Ghosh, the Gopinath deity, uh, there's a ceremony done at the time of the uh, passing of the uh, fathers and the forefathers like that, where one puts the kusagras into the hand. And so after the departure of Govinda Ghosh, the kusagras was laid into the hand of the Gopinath deity. And to this day in that temple, every anniversary of the passing of Govinda Ghosh, this Shraddha ceremony is observed with the deity as the son of Govinda Ghosh like that. So, very, very nice. Now, I'm going to, as I mentioned, these were not only singers, but anybody that sings also writes songs. So, I'm going to read two songs written by Govinda Ghosh. Both of these songs address the pastimes of the Lord in his Navadweep Lila prior to taking sannyas. Govinda Ghosh is writing in a mood of anxiety, of distress. He sings, O oh, Mukunda, my life, what did I suddenly hear today? If I say it, I will die. The words do not even want to come out of my mouth. Goranga is really going to leave Navadweep. We didn't know this, but we saw Gora this morning. He was sitting with his head bowed in thought. Streams of tears flowed from his eyes and washed over his chest and his moon-like face had lost its luster. When we saw him like that, our hearts fluttered and we could not ask anything from him. For a moment, I regained consciousness and humbly asked him the question and that is what he told me. Being disturbed, I ran here to you right away without saying another word to him at all. I have told you this and now you do what you can. As far as we are concerned, 
I don't think that we have any hope of continuing to live. When he heard this, Mukunda started to cry. He could no longer keep his calm as he looked at Gadadhar. Govinda Ghosh then says, Let it not be, for if he leaves us, we shall all die. This is the mood of the residents of Navadweep at the thought of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu leaving. Actually, we mentioned briefly uh, a few weeks ago that Nartam Das Thakur, when he was traveling back to his village of Keturi, he passed through Navadweep. And as he was approaching Navadweep, he began to hurry, thinking, Oh, I'm coming to Navadweep, the pastimes of the Lord. And then when he thought that, he thought, Why should I hurry and go to Navadweep? Mahaprabhu is not there. His associates are not there. This will be a place that will not be filled with any joy. And then indeed, when he got there, he found from Ishan, the servant of Mother Sachi and Vishnu Priya, that the residents that were there were like with no life because Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had departed. So this is the mood of Govinda Gosha's first song. Now, here's the second song that he sings. O people of Navadweep, at whom are you staring? Spread your arms to stop Gora. Make him come back. Who is there now who will clasp you to his chest? Who will come and beg you to take love for Krishna? A shaft has pierced my very heart. Oh, a shaft has pierced my very heart. The image of my life has abandoned Navadweep and gone altogether. No longer will we be able to sit with Goranga. No longer will we be able to enjoy Kirtan the way we did. All the devotees of Navadupa are crying. Their hearts are bursting, and like a stone, Govinda Ghosh does not go to join them, for he cannot stand the pain. So we see the mood that Govinda Ghosh had as it mentioned that when Mahaprabhu told him you should stay in Agra Dweep, he was not very happy about it. He was feeling separation. So this mood of separation manifests itself in these songs that he writes. Now, of course, his brother, I mentioned Vasudev Ghosh, was also a songwriter. And there's two songs I have of his. Actually, he's written many, many songs. There's three songs that I'm going to refer to. Um... The first one is a very famous song of his. I'm not going to bother with the Bengali because I'll make a fool of myself and embarrass those that know Bengali. So this translation is this. If Goranga had not appeared in the Kali Yuga, how could we have tolerated living in this age? How could we have sustained our lives? What Goranga has given, the very gist, the very charm of life, without that, we think it is impossible for anyone to live in this world. Such a thing has been invented and discovered by Goranga. If he had not come, then how could we live? It is impossible to live devoid of such a holy and gracious thing as divine love. Without Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how could we know that Radharani stands supreme in the world of divine love? We have received all of these things from Mahaprabhu. And now we think that life is worth living. Otherwise, to live would have been suicidal. So his mood is completely different than that of his brothers. He's appreciating the wonderful gift of love of God that Mahaprabhu has brought. And how fortunate we in Kali Yuga are that he did bring that. And he says, if had he not brought that, those of us living in the age of Kali Yuga would be suicidal. Now here's another song. He describes the childhood pastimes of Nimai Pandit and it's done in a very, it's translated in a very poetic style. In Sachi Devi's courtyard dances Vishvambar Roy, the master of the universe, a little golden boy. Round and round he runs and plays. At last he runs and hides. You can't find me, he laughs. Oh my, you can't find me, he chides. Oh, Vishwambar, his mother cries, I can't see you, my boy. He runs to her. He holds her sari's hem and leaps up with great joy. 
His merry dance of glee would put the wagtail bird to shame. Thus sings the poet Vasudev of Sri Chaitanya's fame. <laughs> the beauty of his childish form is radiant and fair, enrapturing the minds and hearts of all souls everywhere. So we see a much more upbeat mood in Vasudev. <clears throat> Vasudev has another song here in which he compares the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with the same pastimes of Ram, Krishna, and Lord Jagannath, all three. All glories to the Lord of the universe, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is one and the same with Lord Jagannath. All glories to Lord Jagannath. The three worlds fall before his feet. On the altar, in the temple of Jagannath Puri, Lord Krishna holds the chakra, conch, mace, and lotus. But when he comes to Navadweep Dam, the Lord carries the danda and kamadalu, the staff and water pot of a sannyasi, a renounced mendicant. It is said that the same Ram who previously chastised the demon king Ravana is a Vaibhava expansion of his who descended in order to manifest different pastimes. The Gora avatar descends from Goloka with the mood of Srimati Radharani. In this avatar, the Lord preaches the glories of the holy name of Krishna in the form of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Vasudev Ghosh, with folded hands, chants the glories of the Supreme Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna himself. Lord Jagannath, the master of the universe. Vasudev Ghosh thus glorifies all three of these lords. What do I need to speak of all of your hundreds and hundreds of avatars when, O oh Lord Gauranga, you alone are the topmost? All the Vishnu avatars, as well as Lord Shiva, Sukadev Goswami, Narada Muni, the four Kumaras and all the masters of the universe are begging for the divine love which you alone can distribute. You are famous in your former Leela as Lord Ram for constructing a floating bridge of stones across the Indian Ocean to Sri Lanka. Now in this Kala Yuga, you have given us the bridge of Kirtan, by which even the lame and blind can cross over the ocean of material existence and attain supreme spiritual happiness. Without any qualification for receiving this mercy, all men and women can dance in ecstasy and attain perfection by the mercy of Sri Goranga. As a result of his divine qualities, the ten directions become mad with ecstasy. Therefore, Vasudev Ghosh says, give up all your interest in japa, austerity, and Vedic understanding, and just accept my Sri Goranga as your life and soul. So, very, very wonderful mood. Let me just repeat that one particular line as we're speaking about Kirtan. Now in the Kala Yuga, you have given us the bridge of Kirtan, by which even the lame and blind can cross over the ocean of material existence and attain supreme spiritual happiness. So this is the great gift that we have from these three brothers, Govinda, Vasudev, and Madhava Ghosh. Through their devotion to the Kirtan of the Holy Name, through their devotion to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and through the songs which they've given us, we can feel the opportunity to appreciate and increase our own participation in the process of Kirtan. So we're going to finish there this evening. A little bit before the top of the hour, I saw that we had a few questions going through the chat room. So we're going to go back and take a look at those. Um, I see at the top of the page there, Adi Kavi has asked, if it was a Sheila, can you carve a deity out of it? Well, personalities like you and I certainly cannot. Um, it's unclear whether this was a uh, Shalagram Shila from the Gandaki or whether just a particular type of stone. The word Shila does, by actual definition, mean stone. Mm. So the story doesn't mention, it does say it was a Krishna Shila. So we can 
ascertain that it was a shalagram. But uh, under the direction of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, someone can do such a thing. Yes. So if we are to get that direction, then we can also do that. But otherwise, it's not really what we do. And now the question is also given about the songs of Vishaka. It doesn't give any specific um, songs that the three gopis who became Govinda, Vasudev, and Madhava sang. It simply mentions that they would train Vaibhishaka to sing for the glorification of Radha and Krishna. And as those pastimes are eternal, I'm sure there are many, many, many different songs that were there. Uh, Radha Prem is asking, does anyone have any recordings they can post and send? Uh, well, now, all of the classes we've previously done, Radha Prem, are on the archive section of Krishna.com. If you go to Krishna.com and open up the video section and then go to uh, Lives of the Vaishnavacharyas or to my name, either one, it will pull up the entire list of shows that we have available um, and that's uh, upwards of 30 shows. Uh, uh, R.T. Devi Dasi is asking, at what age can a devotee of Krishna get married? Someone says 15, someone says 16. Actually, in this particular reference, Prabhupada always encouraged in his writings that we had to follow the laws of the land that we lived in. So it would depend, your answer, RT, would be A, it depends upon the country you're living in, what the legal age for marriage is, and it depends upon the consent of the mother and father. These are things which are the way it is done, and we cannot disregard these things. We cannot be marrying 12, 13, 14 year olds, and neither do we want to encourage that we should disregard the uh, concern, at least, of our parents at such a young age. These things are done conjointly with the elders in the family. And if there are no elders present, the parents are not living or anything, then at least with the senior devotees that you're close with. Like that. That would be the answer. Mauricio is asking, do the gopis chant japa? The purpose of chanting japa is to give glorification to the Lord. So the gopis are constantly chanting japa. Now whether they chant 16 rounds, 64 rounds, not likely, not in the way that we do. But their every word is a japa, is a glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yadevi is asking in regards to the question about devotees being married, is it a must for a devotee to be married? Is it a must to get married for a devotee? No, it is certainly not. Neither as a man or a woman is it mandatory that one marries. There is always the renounced life where one decides to remain celibate and dedicate themselves wholly and solely to the service of Krishna. It is very clearly indicated in Shastra that this is a very small majority of people. Uh, basically, maybe 25% of society can be counted in the renounced order. Uh, the majority of people do take up the Grahasta Ashram and therefore we have exemplary Grahasta such as Shivananda Sain and within our own society, many senior devotees who can give a very nice example of how to lead a Krishna conscious family life without being burdened and overwhelmed by the material aspects of relationships. Um, da, 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 da. If you're traveling, isn't it good to save stuff for later on? Oh, Mauricio is asking this about uh, uh, the pastime with Govinda Ghosh. Well, yes, <clears throat> it is. Uh, it is, of course, an issue that one should, you know, not store things and stock things. At the same time, if one's traveling, one should try to make some arrangement. But it depends upon who's traveling. Mahaprabhu was a sannyasi, and he's traveling in such a way that he carries simply what he can carry in his hands. So, in his mood, it was not the proper way. Now, I know when I travel. My suitcase is usually much larger than I'm publicly uh, uh, unembarrassed to show. So, uh, a matter of fact, I was chided in a very friendly way by one dear friend of mine. I bring my own pillow when I go somewhere, my own sheets, you know, like that. So, uh, you know, it depends upon one's lifestyle. But in this regards, there was the principle of renunciation taking prominence 
and the importance of a future Leela of the Lord that has to be considered. Um, if they get married, do the other, does the other person, oh, so R.T. Davy is asking if we require to marry a devotee. Well, let me just answer that in this way, R.T. I've been married almost 30 years now. And I love my wife very dearly. We're both very dedicated to the service of Srila Prabhupada and raising our children. Uh, in any relationship, there's difficulties. And you have to work to overcome them. And fortunately, most devotee couples do that. However, if it's understood that the nature of relationships takes some effort and that there will be differences, why throw into that the difference of religious backgrounds if it's not necessary. If you're a Hare Krishna devotee and you marry someone who is a Baptist just to pick someone, because we live in the South here, you know, then that might make your life a bit complicated. It's nice if you're able to stay within your own circle and have common ground as you approach your marriage. It's not mandatory, but you know, it makes things a little bit easier. Now, Carti, of course, points out that everyone is a devotee, and this is true. You may be able to bring someone to the process of devotional service. Um, it really is an issue of relationships and an issue of the heart. These are not things that can be legislated. You know, we can give general encouragement and guidelines based upon our own experience, but there's no legislation of who we must marry and how those things go like that. So, uh, as you've mentioned, you live there in Wisconsin. You don't have a whole lot of devotee association. Chat rooms like this, you're getting so much nice advice from some of the other ladies here in the chat room. I can see that on the screen here. And, um, you know, by devotees that you have contact with, you take that advice and make the best of it. The main thing is to keep Krishna consciousness strong in your own heart. And then Krishna will guide you in a way that will be beneficial for you. Um, so both the ladies uh, answering you there are in a similar situation and have uh, been able to survive very well in their own Krishna consciousness. So as I say, it is a issue of the heart. Take the guidance of devotees you trust and respect and move forward from there in a Krishna conscious manner. Okay? All right, so it's the top of the hour. Now, I have a bit of news. All of you can pay attention here. Next Monday is our one-year anniversary. We have been broadcasting. Next Monday will be when we have broadcast the lives of the Vaishnava Charyas for one year. And we're planning a very special show. We're going to have a special uh, nectar here. We're going to have special guests. We're going to have, uh, anyway, it'll be lots of fun. I'm not going to tell you everything we're going to have because you won't have to come. <laughs> but uh, tell all of your friends, let's get a full house in the uh, chat room. Let's get all the old crew, any of you out there that regularly correspond with people that usually listen to the show. Let's get them all here. We're going to go a little bit longer maybe. Uh, we'll see how it turns out. But it's, uh, it's going to be very, very nice. Uh, it's going to be next Monday at 8 o'clock and uh, uh, Eastern Standard Time in America because I know some of you are listening from other countries. So Eastern Standard Time in America, 8 o'clock. We're going to celebrate our one-year anniversary with all kinds of special things. So until then, once again, we thank you for joining us for another episode in Lives of the Vaishnava Charis. Hare Krishna.